So, good evening, everybody. You may have realized from the introduction by, by Philip that I've been in this business. I've been around for many years. By the way, when I was talking to some of you who knew me, <coughs> I heard very clearly that uh, he or she, I would not uh, reveal who, is still alive. Huh? That is telling on how many years I've been around. Okay, People were... Uh, uh, remembering about me 40 years ago, 35 years ago. So he is still alive. I took it as a compliment. Okay. <laughs> also, uh, Philip mentioned that uh, we were in this big conference, um, you know, 18 years ago, and uh, we were grilled. Uh, and we were grilled and we reacted very nicely. But in the meanwhile, I have become very aggressive. So don't try to grill me again, OK? I'm very aggressive now, so sorry. For... Thank you very much for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning, everybody. I will, uh, uh, you will not be surprised that I will talk today about um, uh, monetary policy. I've been at the ECB for, f uh, for four years, now at the Bank of Italia. I was board member, now I'm member of the governing council. Monetary policy is one of the most important topics I, I deal with. Although I should say it's a, it's a bit strange to be here as a, as a guest after many years in this building uh, as a board member. Let me start by my, my presentation and I will uh, use uh, a few slides. From the COVID uh, pandemic onwards, we witnessed a combination of shocks with few historical precedents. The global landscape has changed as a result with important implications for both the theory and the practice of monetary policy. At times like this, the dialogue between researchers and policymakers becomes critical. The job of the CHAMP network is to help us policymakers improve our understanding of the economy and the monetary policy transmission network. But a true dialogue requires both parties to engage actively with one another. As they say, it takes two to tango. So my contribution tonight will be to offer my own reading of these events, the events of the uh, last few years, discussing then their implications for the ECB's policy stance. I hope this will highlight some of the challenges that the ECB is confronting uh, today and steer your research going forward. The last tightening cycle took place against an exceptionally complex macroeconomic background. In reflecting on it, we can start from the mother of all questions, which we have discussed uh, several times in this building. Was inflation triggered by demand or supply shocks? Arguably, both. COVID clearly took a big hit on both firms' activities and household income. After the end of the pandemic, aggregate demand increased as citizens gained confidence and dipped into the excess savings accumulated during the lockdowns. However, this demand boost took place at a time when supply disruptions had not yet been resolved, exacerbating bottlenecks and putting pressure on global supply chains. Oil and gas producers cut their exports. Prices rose dramatically for food and agricultural products. And the Russian invasion of Ukraine amplified these shocks, adding to the general uncertainty surrounding the outlook. The initial combination of demand and supply factors rapidly evolved into a situation dominated by imported supply-side shocks. Of course, the story unfolded differently in Europe and in the United States. The U.S. experienced a larger fiscal expansion. Being a net exporter of food and energy, it was less affected by commodity price volatility. In the euro area, by contrast, energy shocks played a major role. 
In other words, the euro area saw a relatively larger share of inflation of the bet type, which is typically more problematic for monetary authorities. Bet type means mainly driven by supply shocks, on which central banks have uh, less, less uh, capacity to, to, to intervene. The ECB responded to the rise in inflation with an unprecedented sequence of interest rate hikes. Calibrating the interventions in real time was truly challenging. Distinguishing between demand and supply shocks is never easy, and it becomes very difficult when many different shocks materialize at the same time, as it was the case in recent years. One also needs to understand how the shocks propagate through the economy. This is not trivial with events that have not been seen for decades. Think of a pandemic or a war on your doorstep. With the luxury of hindsight, we can now see a few signs that the macro outlook could have been read more carefully. One sign comes from a comparison between data and forecasts. As you can see from this slide, slide number two, this is the one year ahead uh, forecast that were produced by, by the ECB at the time. The ECB systematically observed positive surprises for inflation and negative surprises for GDP growth between 2021 Q4 and Q3 2023. This suggests that the shocks we were facing were mainly supply shocks which uh, tend to push prices and quantities in opposite directions. Another sign comes from the credit market. Credit demand declined steadily since the end of 2022, but geopolitical shocks and high energy prices also reduced firms' revenues and increased uh, their riskiness, contributing to a stronger than expected contraction in the supply of credit. All in all, supply shocks seem to have had a more significant impact than demand shocks. However, the Governing Council, the Governing Council is the decision-making body of the European Central Bank. The Governing Council had to perform a difficult balancing act, and it rightly stuck to its key priorities. The key ECB interest rates were still negative in mid-2022, and so a recalibration of the stance was clearly necessary. Furthermore, the rise in inflation came at a time of tight labor markets, raising serious concerns that a wage price spiral could follow. This is a risk that no central bank can take nor downplay on the basis of flimsy separations of demand and supply shocks. The priority in 2022 was to bring inflation down and keep long-term inflation expectations anchored, a bold response to the price pressures achieved all three objectives. The macro outlook is, of course, very different now. Core inflation has declined steadily since July 2023, while GDP growth has remained flat around zero. Inflation expectations are stable. After peaking in 2023, wage growth is now evolving in line with our projections, our meaning the euro system projections, which anticipate a return to target in 2025. It is also important to stress that wage growth need not be a problem, not necessarily. One needs to consider wages along with other input costs, profits, and productivity, not in isolation. And there are at least three scenarios where wages can grow without creating inflationary pressures. First, as you can see from this slide, a wage rise could take place in a context where firms' total production costs decline or remain constant. On the, the left-hand uh, uh, panel of the chart, you see inflation, the blue line, and uh, uh, unit labor costs, the yellow line. On the right 
the panel, you see again inflation and total unit costs. The difference is intermediate uh, inputs, mainly energy, but also others. And you, you see that in the, maybe this is in the text, but uh, in the left-hand uh, panel, uh, we have seen in, uh, in the last uh, year an increase in acceleration in wages, the yellow line, and a reduction in inflation. Why? Well, because uh, probably firms have paid uh, more attention to total costs. And on the right-hand panel, you see that the red line that uh, uh, indicates total costs has been moving in, in sync with inflation. Maybe I will repeat something, but never mind. Firms apply markups to total costs, not to wages. So if the cost of yeah, in other inputs drop, wages can rise without affecting prices. There's a second scenario in which wages do not necessarily, in, in, uh, accelerating wages do not necessarily imply that inflation has also to accelerate. Firms may absorb a rise in wages or in total costs by simply reducing their margins leaving prices unchanged. Third scenario, a rise in wages could be accompanied by a rise in productivity. In this case, unilabor costs may remain constant or even decline despite a higher wage bill. In the euro area, total costs have normalized and are now growing at their pre-pandemic rate, as you see from the slide. Moreover, firms enjoy fat margins. And the labor productivity is bound to recover as the adverse impact of energy shocks recedes. Under these conditions, the probability, this is my reading of the uh, conjuncture, the probability of a wage-driven inflationary spiral is relatively low. So is everything fine? Unfortunately not, not necessarily. In the longer term, firms should invest more in order to in order for workers to become more productive. This is a complex theme that goes uh, beyond the remit of central banks. However, hesitations in adjusting rates, this is a diplomatic way of saying cutting rates, hesitations in adjusting uh, uh, rates would discourage firms from investing. This could delay the expansion of the capital stock hamper productivity and generate a competitive disadvantage for the euro area in global markets. In this new scenario, the scenario we are living in now, the balance of risks faced by the ECB is very different from what we were facing in the past. According to the ECB survey of professional forecasters, the upside risks for inflation that dominated in the 2022-2023 have receded and the risks for economic activity are now strongly tilted to the downside. In short, a downturn is a more concrete danger than a new bout of inflation. Taking this risk seriously is important for at least two reasons. The interest rate hikes implemented thus far will keep biting in the coming quarters. In fact, according to Banca d'Italia uh, research, but there are many other uh, analyses done outside the Bank of Italy, their impact on inflation could be greater in 2024 than it was in 2023 because of lags. Furthermore, the ECB is shrinking its balance sheets, and it is doing so faster than most other central, bank, central banks. We have relatively little evidence on the effects of a contraction of the balance sheet of the central bank. But the bank lending survey suggests that the balance sheet reduction may have a negative influence on the liquidity and lending volumes of euro area banks, not the contractionary stimulus. So what should the ECB do next? The truth is that I don't know. Now I start my speculation. The ECB should seriously consider the possibility that monetary policy could become too tight going forward. Monetary policy is obviously too tight if, if it ends up causing a deep recession. But it is, it is also too tight if it pushes inflation below target and causes a prolonged economic stagnation. We are reasonably far from the first scenario, from a deep recession, but we cannot rule out, at least not yet, the second one, 
the possibility of inflation going too low and uh, uh, the economy experiencing a, a prolonged stagnation. Unlike in the United States, the euro area GDP and consumption are still well below the pre-pandemic levels. As you can see in uh, slide number four, in its uh, last projections, the, the international, sorry, this is not about the, the, the projections. In, in its last projections, the International Monetary Fund predicts the US to grow over three times as much as the euro area in 2024. The US are uh, expected to grow 2.7%, while the euro area is projected to grow by 0.8% in 2024. In other words, we now need to recover from the recovery. The euro area has to need to, to, uh, uh, now needs to recover from the recovery, and we are unlikely to do it this year. Monetary policy is certainly not the, the main cause of this divergence between the euro area economy and the US economy, but it should not prevent the euro area from achieving its full potential. Overlooking downside risks to inflation would be equally foolish. For years, the ECB spent most of its energies trying to lift the euro area out of the zero lower bound. That experience demonstrates that letting inflation slip below the 2% target could be extremely costly. It is of paramount importance to act in a timely fashion to minimize these risks. In my view, the ECB's action should be guided by three considerations going forward. First, think about the big picture surrounding decisions on interest rates. Today, the big picture includes modest growth prospects and high political uncertainty at the global level. In Europe, the big picture also includes a more restrictive fiscal stance and a rundown of central bank balance sheets, a policy mix that is unlikely to support aggregate demand. Second, inaction is not neutral. Based on current expectations, the ECB stance is likely to remain restrictive with real rates about their natural level well into 2025. Keeping in mind the longer variable lags in the transmission mechanism, this state of affairs clearly calls for timely action. Steering monetary policy is like steering a tanker. And if the helmsman or the helms woman does not act well in advance, they will crash into the harbor. And we should avoid this. Third, gradualism is important. Timely action would allow the ECB to be nimble and move in small uh, progressive steps. Small rate cuts would counter weak demand and could be posed at no cost if upside, upside shocks to inflation were to materialize along the way. That would also minimize the likelihood of the ECB falling behind the curve and having to hastily resort to larger rate cuts in the future. An important question that has recently come up in the debate is to what extent these decisions should be linked to the course followed by the United States, by the Federal Reserve. What if the ECB decouples from the Federal Reserve? Personally, <clears throat> I do not see <clears throat> this issue as particularly critical at the current juncture. The ECB's projections always, always take into account the expected path on the, of interest rates in the US and beyond. Unexpected changes in the Fed's stance cannot by definition, be included in the forecast. But if anything, they reinforce the case for a rate cut rather than weakening it. Higher than expected rates in the United States would cause a depreciation of the euro, and this is the obvious uh, uh, macro 101 type of effect. But they would also cause a decline in global demand and a tightening in global financial conditions. And this is an empirical issue. And research shows that in the medium term, the net impact of the spillover is likely to be uh, both recessionary and disinflationary. So let me conclude. The last two years have been uh, tough for policy, but good for research. 
It is not common to witness geopolitical shifts in 1970s style energy crisis, large swings in inflation, and a record monetary tightening cycle in the space of 24 months. And it may not be over yet. After the direct confrontation between Israel and Iran in, of the past few weeks, political tensions in the Middle East are bound to remain high, unfortunately. Being on the policy side of this trench, I hope that researchers will make the most of this experience. I'm sure you will do. When I was doing my own research, the most challenging thing that I, uh, problem I was facing was to find an exogenous shock. You have plenty of exogenous shocks. Now you, you only have to choose which one you like. <laughs> you should dissect these complex events, turn them into a better understanding of how the economy works, and provide us with notions and tools that can be deployed in the not too distant future to render monetary policy more effective. I hope my remarks tonight have given you an idea, at least an idea, of some of the issues and the complexities that sit at the top of the priority list for me and presumably for many of my colleagues within the European system of central banks. So thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions. And uh, for those who are here tonight, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. So I guess there's room for a couple of questions. You don't have to, eh? Let them breathe once. Yeah. OK. Please. <clears throat> Thank you for an outstanding talk. Um, what do you make of the post-COVID growth differential between the US and the euro area? That is, you said this is not caused by monetary policy, which I agree with. But what is it caused by? Well, I guess here there are both structural and conjunctural factors. First, the stimulus which was given by fiscal policy in the US was huge. Uh, compared to the uh, even uh, substantial stimulus, fiscal stimulus, which was uh, given uh, to the economy in the euro area. Uh, second, uh, the structure of the economy is very different. Um, after the pandemic in the US, um, uh, firms fired their employees and the government intervened in subsidizing individuals. And then th those people were rehired after the shock. Maybe that there was uh, a necessary reallocation of labor across different sectors. Maybe that the pandemic has changed the relative convenience uh, uh, in terms of productivity, profitability across sectors. And the strategy followed in the euro area that is uh, protecting uh, places, protecting uh, the employees in their previous job was not the most convenient one. Third, uh, there is probably a you know, the, a, a, an environment that is more easily conducive to investment, especially in uh, uh, technological sectors in the US, which are the winning sectors, and that is paying off in terms of, of growth. Of course, there could be other conjunctural factors, and uh, I'm not arguing that monetary policy is, is part of this. I'm arguing that we should not become part of this. I'd like to ask you about uh, a little bit monetary policy transmission, or, or better said, about. Uh, Can you speak louder? Yeah, sorry. Uh, before the before the crisis, I mean, not the the, the the 2007 crisis, central banks operated in a more. I mean, communication between central banks and the public was not as clear as evolved during the crisis. I mean, just before COVID, forward guidance was in place, and there was very much about transmitting. But now we are in this world of data dependency. So do you think that this data dependency is here to stay, or that uh, alternative ways of communicating to the market uh, that are not as radical as forward guidance? So what is your stance about the, the, 
the future or the or the near future of communication between central banks and uh, and markets, especially. Yeah, I don't see the main feature of. Let's talk about the ECB. Our communication being data dependency. We still uh, pay attention to our reaction function, and uh, uh, our monetary policy statement always refers to the three key variables, which I never remember, but they are in the, in the monetary policy statement, and uh, the, the reaction function is guiding our uh, monetary policy decisions. And uh, of course, the way you uh, operationalize uh, your response uh, based on the reaction function is looking at the data. And this is simple to, to, to explain when you deal with the general public. Also, <clears throat> uh, you know, we had an experience with forward guidance and uh, was not the most, uh, uh, um, the happiest and uh, the most uh, fruitful experience. And uh, when you realize that the world is, uh, the economy is experiencing shocks that, uh, you know, as I said in my, in my uh, initial comments, you know, I'm sure that nobody in this room has ever seen a pandemic. I, I never thought I could uh, see a pandemic in, in, in Europe in my life. I never thought I could be worried that the door, the, 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 the war could break into uh, uh, Europe, not even at the doorstep. I mentioned in the doorstep in my, in my, in my uh, comments, but uh, not even uh, uh, at the doorstep. I mean, there, there were so many, the bottlenecks. Whoever thought that you would go to a shop and you don't get the goods you want to buy because you know, they do not have enough inventories, enough intermediate uh, products. I bought a car when I was here in Germany and I had to wait for nine months. Nine months, not, not a luxury car, not a very strange car, a normal car. And the reason was that the uh, old cars are now equipped with chips and the chips were not available because the transportation, because the companies did not recover from the lockdowns uh, rapidly enough. So there were so many events that were uh, uh, unprecedented that uh, uh, doing projections and uh, you know looking to the the, the uh, future many months away was difficult. So we had to shorten the horizon. And I think that the, the data dependence is a nice way to communicate all these difficulties to the general public. Thank you very much for the interesting speech. I would have a question related to the note that you took that um, there's another fundamental difference between the US and the, United, and the Euro area, and that's the long run growth outlook. And one key difference contributing to that is the difference in an innovation capacity, basically, between the two countries. So from that viewpoint, I'm wondering how, what's your view on how contractionary monetary policy can be from the viewpoint of innovation and uh, long-run potential output, also in general thinking of potential output dynamics and also um, basically at the costs of the monetary contraction and relatedly up to the point that at some point through the TFP effects, at least over the medium term, this effect may also be self-defeating from an inflation viewpoint. <clears throat> I'm still convinced that monetary policy can do relatively little about long-term growth unless one starts speculating about hysteresis. I think that uh, the, the attitude, the different attitude that you see in the US um, uh, compared to the Euro area in uh, uh, investment in technology depends on many different things than monetary policy. Of course, monetary policy should not stand in the way of the recovery. You should not delay the increase in investment. You should not delay the accumulation of capital. I don't think if I had to list the factors that explain the, the uh, uh, higher potential in the US than in the Euro area, I will not list monetary policy first, not even second, not even third, maybe even lower than that. Um, you know, the attitude is different. Look at what is happening now in the US with the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, which has nothing to do with inflation, okay? They are just uh, implementing a protection policy to attract investment in uh, high tech sectors from all over the world, sometimes at the expense of uh, like-minded countries because the specificity for the uh, possibility to enjoy the IRA benefits 
are such that in many cases, even European companies would not qualify. So uh, it's a different stance. They are investing lots of money uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, advanced uh, sectors, high-tech uh, high sectors. They have been doing that for many years. They have a different structure of the labor market, a totally different environment. So it turns out that uh, they are, um, you know, the U.S. economy is more conducive to growth in high-tech sectors, and those are the sectors that are driving productivity. And so I would not consider monetary policy as tremendously relevant still. I would not want monetary policy to contribute to add to the gap. Fabio, so uh, can we move away from monetary policy? No. And <laughs> I still, I, I will ask my question. Okay. So um, basically, uh, you talk about technology and uh, and, and and where uh, central banks and supervisors uh, are thinking also of uh, how technology may change uh, the supply of financial services. And so, uh, you know, going to your, 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 your life, uh, your previous life as a scholar in this area as well, uh, I mean, do you see there a potential to, um, to, to basically lift the growth potential uh, in this part of the world because of, or thanks to, to, to uh, you know, major innovations uh, coming from AI, improving the allocation of capital by the financial system, and, and how can, in your view, can, can central banks, uh, not through monetary policy, but through the other uh, responsibilities, uh, favor this, uh, this evolution? Absolutely. You know, there, there are many things that central banks can do in Europe, and they are doing. One is the, the uh, use of technology in the financial sector. And for me, the frontier there is in the payments sector. Payments are the most advanced part of financial intermediation. They are driving uh, uh, technological progress in the financial sector at large. And uh, as you know, uh, central banks are very active. And this institution, uh, meaning DSB and the national central banks, are uh, uh, extremely active in uh, um, uh, promoting the use of uh, digital uh, technology in payments, artificial intelligence, in developing advanced uh, 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 systems for uh, market infrastructures, CCPs, CSDs, but let, let, let's stick uh, to payments. Uh, Philip mentioned the digital euro. I think that the introduction, the possible introduction, because th this is still ongoing discussion in, in the euro area, uh, the introduction of a digital means of payment would be a way to facilitate, to promote the adoption of technology, not only in the, in the financial sector, not only in the um, household sector, but also in the government sector. Because if governments and uh, you know, public offices have to adapt themselves to receive uh, digital payments everywhere in the Euro, that would be a big step forward. Um, wholesale. We are already studying, the, the Euro system is already studying the introduction of, of um, <clears throat> uh, DLT, of artificial intelligence in the wholesale uh, sector. We are studying the tokenization of financial instruments, the tokenization with settlement in central bank money. Okay, I, I don't want you to, to believe that I'm objective in this, but we are at the frontier in this. The Euro area is at the frontier in the central banking landscape. So it is very important, not only because of the potential improvement in the allocation of financial resources by um, uh, highly digitalized uh, financial intermediaries, but also because this would spread the use of technology in the economy, in critical sectors of the economy. It's, it is crucial, it is crucial. But this is a very peculiar role for uh, central banks. Uh, then there is uh, an entire universe uh, that goes beyond central banks in the adoption of technology that involves uh, research, uh, involves the, the, the universities, 
uh, involves uh, the, the uh, average size of uh, firms in each uh, economic jurisdiction. There are so many other dimensions, but uh, central banks uh, uh, are part of the picture, not the main element, but they are part of the picture. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot.